All right. So we're going to cover today is Niagara 2, which is our uh, next generation of CMT. We've had Niagara 1 in the, f uh, in the field about two years. So this is our next generation, Niagara 2. We announced it um, about three weeks ago. We had a launch in uh, Vegas um, at the CEC. And we have systems um, associated with this Niagara 2. Next generation after this is called Victoria Falls, which will be the first SMP versions of Niagara, two-way and four-way. But this is our, our current offering. It um, still has eight cores. Uh, around a crossbar, so a very similar design to what we had in Niagara 1, but we've really beefed up a lot of, the, of the, uh, what's in the cores. The process has gone from 90 nanometer technology down to 65, so um, we've been able to put a lot more flops on the die and, and produce a lot more um, actually with those flops. Each core now has two integer pipelines, so there are 16 pipelines altogether on the Niagara 2 chip. Each pipeline has got four threads for a total of 64 threads. So two integer pipelines and uh, 64 threads on the die. Each core also now has a floating point unit. So that was one of the real weak spots of Niagara. One was the, the lack of floating point performance. Now we've got 11.2 uh, gigaflops of um, raw floating point bandwidth um, using the Niagara 2 process. So a single fully pipelined floating point unit per core. Each core also has a fully um, functional crypto coprocessor. So we've got eight coprocessors to do all of your favorite hashes and ciphers. DES, triple DES, AES, et cetera, plus all of the MAU stuff, uh, RSA, DSA operations. So we have huge amount of crypto bandwidth as well going across the eight cores. The other big change that we made on with Niagara 2 from Niagara 1 was we put two 10 gig ports directly on silicon. So now we have two Zowies coming off the die, going plugged directly out through the motherboard uh, out the back of the system. So you can get native 10 gig performance directly into the processor. And this saves you about 30% performance um, when you're doing 10 gig uh, network processing. The other thing we did, on, if you see on the right-hand side of the die, we've integrated the PCI Express. So in Niagara 1, we had the Niagara 1 processor, then we had an ASIC called Fire that turned JBus into PCI Express. We've taken that ASIC and we've integrated it onto the Niagara 2 processor itself. So now we have by 8 um, um, PCI Express come directly out of the, of the uh, chip. So as you can see, this is why we call it system on a chip. We've integrated everything into a single piece of silicon. The crossbar can do about 162 gigabytes of raw bandwidth between the cores. The cores are still um, linked together. It's still a UMA um, um, layout. The L2 cache went from 3 meg to 4 meg and went from 12-way associative to 16-way associative. So that we added the associativity because we now have twice the threads that want to share the cache we want to make sure that we don't have a lot more conflicts on the cache by doubling the threads. The other big change that we made was we went from DDR2 to FBDIM. We did this for a number of reasons. One is capacity. Second was pins. Went from about 1,100 pins down to 400 pins, so it made the packaging a lot, lot simpler. And also bandwidth. We could get about 23 gigabytes of raw bandwidth with Niagara 1. With Niagara 2, we can get to 62 gigabytes, so about 40 uh, read, 20 uh, odd write. So about 60 gigabytes of raw bandwidth. Folks were mentioning earlier about bandwidth being a bottleneck. For Niagara 1, Niagara 1 and Niagara 2, it's really not a bottleneck. It is an extremely wide pipe to memory. And then an extremely wide pipe from L2 cache to your cores. So that's the how, how we manage to scale on our CMT processor. Okay? So we offered a processor at 1.2 and 1.4 gigahertz in systems with 1U, 2U, blades, and a whole range of, of other servers. This is a, a die picture. Very quickly, you see the uh, crossbar in the middle. You've got uh, the yellow is the 10 gig, the purple is the PCI Express, and then the four L2 caches around the outside. OK. <laughs> so this is a, a view of the pipeline, each, um, each pipeline pr in the core. You can see you have two execution units, EX0 and, and 1. These are your integer pipelines, eight stage pipelines. And then the four threads run on those pipelines. The four threads cannot migrate. So the same four, zero to three, will run on execution zero, and then four to seven will run on execution one. So they're, they're bound to those um, pipelines. Then you go down, we have a shared floating point unit, full pipeline, 12 stage floating point unit, a shared LSU. To the side is what's called the SPU. That's our crypto coprocessor hanging off the side. And then we have a shared MMU. What we've done in um, Niagara 2 is we've put a hardware table walk in for TLB missing. So that's reduced by about 60% the cost of TLB misses on Niagara 2 
versus the other one. Okay? And then they're all connected together via a gasket into the L2, uh, into the crossbar that links it to other cores and to the L2 cache. Okay? So this core is then stamped eight times um, on the die. Okay, this is a, a view of the pipeline. So you see we had eight stage integer pipeline and a 12 stage floating point pipeline. For floating point, there's a six cycle latency to get to it, which is a huge improvement over Niagara One. Niagara One had to go through the crossbar, had a 40 cycle uh, penalty to get to the FPU. Now we've got um, just a six cycle, and in most cases it's fully pipelined. This is the integer pipeline. You see you got the, um, the, the two groups, you got the four thread groups pair. Each one has got, um, you mirrored the uh, various stages of the integer pipeline and then down to the LSU. Okay. So the floating point unit, which is probably of most important to uh, a lot of HPC folks, we actually have three pipelines in it. We've got an FPX, an FGX for graphics, and then FP, FPD, hard to say, which does your divide and square root. It also does pop C, pixel compare, and a whole bunch of other um, minor um, units. The, the delay, as we discovered on Friday, to pop C is nine cycles. That's the, the cost of getting to the pop C unit. And the, the, the FPX and the FGX are fully pipelined with just a one cycle uh, penalty between, and the, but the FPD is not pipelined. So there is a penalty if you've got to go to those long latency um, commands. We have full viz 2.0. In Niagara 1, a lot of the viz instructions were only emulated in software, but now we've uh, um, actually given back uh, viz 2.0. And then we've, we've actually used the floating point unit for some of the uh, multiplication, et cetera, that's needed for the crypto. So the crypto has a separate line from the crypto unit into the floating point unit and back out again. Okay. So this is what it looks like. So you've got um, the three different pipelines, one for admol, one for your viz, and then one for the divide square root. You see the um, integer crypto coming in. The ad and the multi are actually used by the integer pipeline as well to do the multiplication. And then, and then it comes from the other side out to the store unit. So it load data back out to the store. So this is a difference you see between Niagara 1 and Niagara 2. Um, in Niagara 1, um, 32 threads shared the single floating point unit. Now only eight share. We have power management now. We have it within the core, obviously, which reduce, um, reduces the, 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 the latency. We have quad precision on the um, Niagara 2. And uh, sorry, the only thing that's emulated on the uh, Niagara 2 is quad precision. Everything else is actually done in silicon. It's fully pipelined, and uh, one, um, one per cycle can enter into the actual pipeline. The crypto unit, um, which is one per core as well, this is what it looks like. You've got um, actually three parts to it. You've got the MA execution, which is what we use for RSA, DSA. You've got the hash engine, which is all of your hashes. And then you've got the uh, cipher engines, which do um, your, your, your various ciphers. So we also have extra units in there as well. We've got a CRC and we have a, actually got a copy unit in there, but we haven't enabled those in Solaris yet. We're looking at, at ways of enabling those as well. So the way it works, it's DMA. So you basically uh, put your data into a, uh, a buffer. You um, tell the, the crypto unit to go and uh, process it, and then it will be dma back into your memory, the result. So it's completely a coprocessor. Your normal pipeline can uh, um, continue on with its execution while the crypto is done. So this looks at some of the uh, performance that we've achieved. This is the, the raw performance that can be achieved with the hardware. We achieve these numbers by doing a, sl a, a small driver in the kernel to talk directly with the crypto unit and to drive the performance. Okay? So these are the numbers we have for bulk cipher. We've got like the RC4 DES, triple DES, and you can see up to 80 three gigabits per second on the uh, RC4. We got the RSA. We've managed to do 37,000 RSA ops per second. It was 14,000 on Niagara 1, so that's a huge increase in performance over 2x. And then we've got the, the secure hash like MD5 and SHA, which um, are get, gain about 30 to 40 gigabits per second. That's a lot of raw crypto bandwidth if you're, if you're trying to push crypto through a chip. And the huge advantage is that it gives you idle CPU, gives you back your CPU. So this is the, the way if you look at this, didn't come out very well, I'm afraid, Ruth. <laughs> when you look at the actual cost of crypto, what the biggest, biggest challenging thing with crypto is the packet size. If you've got small packets, it's really hard to offload it into hardware because the software overlayers cost you more than the actual crypto itself, right? 
So as you can see in this diagram, it shows from the small packet size, about 256 bytes, all the way up to 32K byte packets. And you can see the advantage that the crypto unit gives you. So down at the small packets, it's a kind of a break even because software overheads are too high. When you get to about 1024, 2048, you really start to see huge advantages. And what we're showing here is the throughput relative to um, eight threads running in parallel or 64 threads running in parallel. And it didn't come out very well, but those blue dots there are the actual hardware maximum that can be achieved by the crypto itself. Okay? So if you can see, at around 4K with 64 uh, threads, you're getting close to the, to the hardware maximum here. Okay, so as I said, many, uh, previously mentioned, uh, we moved from DDR2 to FBDIM, and the main reason we did that was for, um, for throughput, right? The, the channels run at four gigabits per second. There's four memory controllers, and each memory controller has got um, two channels in it, channel A and B, right? What, we've, what we've, you have to do with FBDIM, however, is you've got to program to the latency of the furthest away FBDIM. So FBDIMs can be one deep, two deep, four deep. When we get to Victoria Falls, we go to four deep DIMs, and so your latency is dependent on a bunch of settings in it that you put into the FB DIM and into the memory controller for the longest latency FC, F, the FB DIM. What we're seeing with our um, FB DIM is about 126 nanoseconds latency. So that's up about 25% over Niagara 1. Niagara 1 was about 95 nanometers, nan, nanosecond um, memory latency. But the bandwidth has gone up dramatically from 21 gigabytes per second to 63 gigabytes per second. The other thing, we, like I said, we put in um, PCI Express. We integrate it directly onto the, onto the die. And these are the, um, the PCI bandwidth and latency numbers that we have f between Niagara 1 and Niagara 2. So what we've done is we use a card called Bobo. It's a PCI Express exercise. You just stick it into, the, uh, into your system, and it just drives raw PCI Express packets. And what we've achieved uh, with the on-chip um, uh, Niagara 2 is we can achieve about 1.5 gigabytes of raw bandwidth read, uh, uh, write, and 1.6 read. And then read and write combined, we get to about 2.5 gigabytes per second. That's the, the raw bandwidth that the chip can actually um, maintain. And the latency is about, um, on Niagara 2, is about 805 nanoseconds. Now, your latency is very much dependent on a lot of things. It's dependent on the switches and the stuff that is between the chip and getting out to your actual card. So, so on Niagara 2, we have two layers of uh, PLX switches, and that's why the latency is a little bit longer than will be desired. When we go to Victoria Falls, we have two by eights, and we get nearly five gigabytes of raw bandwidth with the next generation um, systems. Okay, so the other thing that we, like I said previously, we integrated was the um, 10 gig. We put two 10 gig Zowies directly onto the actual chip, and we've also taken that piece of silicon, and we've made our own NIC. So Sun has a, a NIC called um, Neptune, and a card called Atlas, which is a PCI Express-based 10 gig but it shares the exact same silicon between Niagara 2 and, and, the PC, uh, and the Neptune NIC. The only difference is we've added four more DMA channels when we went to a PCI Express link. But what you can see here on the NIU, which is what we have um, built into the chip, you get two 10 gig ports, you get eight uh, DMA channels transmit, eight DMA channels um, receive, and um, you get a certain amount of classification in hardware at the levels of one, two, and three in your classification. So the huge advantage you get with NIU, which is our integrated networking, is much lower CPU overhead. Because you do not have to pay the cost of the PCI Express middleman. PCI Express is packet-based, and so there's a lot of back and forth in that protocol. And you can really reduce the amount of CPU required to run a 10 gig NIC. So if we look at the, the, the network performance, you can see here we have the results for one NIU integrated onto the Niagara 2, two NIUs, and one of the PCI Express cards which is Atlas. So for, for one NIU, you, you can get about 9.4 gigabits per second raw bandwidth into the chip. And you can get about 9.4 uh, ORX as well receive. This is very similar to what you get with the Atlas. When you go to two NIUs, you can get 14 gigabits TX and nearly 18 gigabits uh, ORX. The huge advantage here is you still have your PCI Express bandwidth as well. So these two NIUs are running completely independent of the PCI Express subsystem. And so you, you, can, you, can, you can have both the NIUs running and PCI Express running at the same time. So that's when we published our spec web numbers. We had nearly 18 gigabits of raw bandwidth, two NIUs plus an Atlas card, all driving 10 gig packets at the same time. 
So this is a huge advantage if you're network intensive and for your application. The other big thing is the, the overhead. You can push 18 gigabits per second and only utilize 66% of your um, CPU. And that's a, that's a huge advantage to a lot of customers because you may be able to push the bandwidth, but if you've no CPU left on your box, there's not much point, right? I was thinking, it was 10 minutes, five minutes ago. <laughs> so the huge advantage of, PC, uh, of NIU is lower overhead on the CPU, which is always good when you're looking to run an application in the background. Okay, so the servers that we've got, the first server that we launched uh, a couple of weeks ago was the T5220. This is a 2U box. It can have up to eight disks in it, but if you go ATO, you can actually go to 16 drives. It has got uh, six slots at the back, and these could be PCI Express slots, or two of them can be our 10 gig um, Zowie that we talked about previously. It's got four um, giggies built in. It's got uh, up to eight drives and a, uh, a single Niagara 2 processor in. We offer a four-way, uh, sorry, a four-core, a six-core, an eight-core, a 1.2 and a 1.4 gigahertz. This box probably maxes about 650 watts. You know, it depends on what your application is doing. The max that we've drawn is 650 with spec web, fully populated with both disks and PCI Express. Typical is probably more around 400 watts. But if you're really looking for compute density, we have a 1U. So the 1U is, is the exact same motherboard as the 2U, except it's only got three PCI Express slots and half the disk. So it can have up to four drives in it but you get the exact same Niagara 2. You still get 64 threads, you still get eight floating point units, and, and you get it in a 1U um, form factor. And at a max power of 500 watts, typical more likely 350. So for compute density, it definitely is, is where you want to go. The other uh, um, offering that we have is a blade. So we have a Niagara 2 blade that fits into our Constellation chassis. So, so th th this was also announced three weeks ago. So now you can have Niagara 1, a Niagara 2 blade, you can also have an AMD blade and, and an Intel blade all in the same chassis, side by side. So that's unique in the industry in that you can share multiple blades of different, um, um, different types of processors.